I think I've mentioned in the past this very simple way in which I approach the Dogen's koan collection, which is that I, I just read things and I, I have this initial reaction. Does this hit me? Does this resonate with me? Does it, does it feel like something that I can kind of chew on with all of you? And, and most of the time, when I present a koan, it's one that immediately has that, that quality for me. And tonight, I wanted to bring one that has a little bit different quality, which is that I read it, and I, I didn't feel that way. <laughs> I, I didn't feel like I had a way in, and so I went past it. And then I went back to it, and I looked at it again, and it started to, I don't know, it, I, I started to carry it around a little bit. And finally, uh, when I looked at it a, a third or fourth time, I thought, oh, I have something to say. So this is number 73 from Dogen's collection. And it goes like this. This is it's a little unusual in the way it's presented. Priest Mimoyan of Mount Wutai always held a two-pronged pitchfork. When he saw a monastic coming, he would hold up the pitchfork and say, what kind of demon has made you leave the household? What kind of demon caused you to wander? If you can say it, you will be killed with this pitchfork. If you can't say it, you will be killed with this pitchfork. Say it now, quickly. So right away, this is kind of different because there's no exchange. It's always a monk approaching another monk. It's someone approaching a teacher. There's a question or there's a challenge. There's some sort of setup. But this is just a really quick paragraph about this guy. There was this guy who always did this thing. That's it. That's the whole koan. And what he did was this. He would sit there with his pitchfork, his weird little two-pronged pitchfork, really good it's a prop right he's he's not just saying i'm going to kill you he's saying i'm going to kill you with this right and when when monks would appear to him in whatever context we don't even get to really know why are they coming to him specifically they must know by the way eventually that this is what they're going to get but but he sits there with the pitchfork and when they come he says what kind of demon made you leave the household. Now, leaving the household means being ordained. In Japanese, we say shukke tokudo. Shukke is leaving the house. And that would be uh, contrasted with something like zaike tokudo, which is uh, like a householder ordination, like a lay ordination. So, so what demon caused you to do this? He says, what kind of demon caused you to wander? If you can say it, you'll be killed with this pitchfork. If you can't say it, you will be killed with this pitchfork. Say it now. And you can imagine, for the ones who aren't expecting this, whoa. Right? They're being presented with a kind, of, a kind of thing that we do see over and over in the koan literature where we're told that there's a rock and there's a hard place. And we're not offered any option C. Maybe the, the most famous or the, or the most evocative version of this is when you're hanging by a branch on a cliff and above you, tigers, and below you, a rocky death. What do you do? There's no way up and there's no way down. And yet there has to be something. In this one, Mimoyan is saying, if you name this demon, you'll die. If you don't name this demon, you'll die. 
what do we do? There are multiple ways, as with all these, to understand these. And I think part of why I went back to this one, part of what, what works on the surface with this koan, is that both answers just lead to dying. And that feels, on a surface level, just so true. Right? Like, if you can get it right, you're going to die. And if you, can get, and if you don't get it right, yeah, you're still going to die. There's something so true and so, so simple about that. But then the question actually is really interesting. He's looking at a monk and he, of course, he's a monk. Immediately there's an identification, there's an understanding of this role and of this path. And he's saying, what, what brought you here? But the way he says it is, what chased you here? What is it in your mind? What is it in your life that you were running away from that brought you to this moment in your life? And your options are to recognize what that is or to not recognize what that is. But either way, he says, you lose. Who among us would escape the pitchfork? Who among us is not avoiding something. Who among us is not making decisions, is not living a life based on getting away from something? And what is it? For me, this koan speaks to the issue of spiritual bypassing, which is so real and such a deep, deep poison in a tradition like this one. There's, there's a kind of cliche, simple version of spiritual bypassing that goes like this. You know, someone takes up spiritual practice. Maybe they take up Buddhist practice. And then they, they get angry. And what I mean is the anger arises in the body, anger arises in the mind. But instead of expressing it, instead of acknowledging it even, they say to themselves and to everyone, oh, I don't get angry. I'm Buddhist. I remember so clearly one time, and it must be almost 20 years ago now, being invited to dinner by a, a local Buddhist. He'd been practicing for many, many years um, in various communities. He invited me over for dinner. I had never met him before. And we talked about Thich Nhat Hanh, who himself teaches such a peaceful path, such a gentle path. And this man, as he spoke about it, with such love and such reverence and such identification, also seemed to be seething with rage to the point almost of feeling dangerous. I remember sitting at the table and watching him so closely and thinking, something is not working here. Something is being left unacknowledged because I thought he might explode. It wasn't the first time I had seen that, and it wasn't the last. And if you spend time in this world, in these circles, you'll see it. Because this practice and these teachings can give us a reason to believe 
that we are untouched, that we are unaffected by something. That's a very simple version. It's usually more subtle. But what it comes down to is the same, that we treat ourselves as being simpler than we are. Because we imagine that what we're working on is taking place on a kind of higher plane. Right? Certain kinds of problems, those are base problems. Those are normal people problems. But I'm working on spiritual problems. And for me to be working on these spiritual problems must mean, whether I ever have the conscious thought or not, that I don't have those other problems, or that I'm beyond them, or that I'm above them. I come from I check all the boxes for privilege, all of them. I'm, I'm, I'm a white, cisgendered, straight male. I'm tall. I can go on and on. My life has been pretty good. And maybe because of that, and maybe because of temperament, and maybe because I was interested in these lofty things. I had an idea for a long, long, long time that I was just a very simple person. I would see other people get really mad at things and I would say, oh, I don't really get mad. And I see people get really low and I think, oh, I don't really get low. I'm just a stable dude. And whether that was fed by Zen practice or it fed into Zen practice, I don't know. But it wasn't a very curious view of myself. I liked this story about me. I liked the story about me where I'm kind of untouched by things. I think it took until my 30s, and then started to hit harder in my 40s, for me to start to recognize that I was not that. To recognize that I could hold deep resentments, or that I could be angry, or that I could just be sad, that I could be really sad. We have these moments, you know, we watch movies, and we find ourselves really rooting for someone in some situation, and if we had to answer right then and right there, why why this? Why am I so attached to this? Why does this mean so much to me? We might not be able to explain. Or we watch a TV commercial and we're crying. And we don't know why. And part of the answer is that just two or three layers down, there's a part of us that's just crying all the time. but we go through life with some story. And when we have that story, we don't know what it is that's chasing us. We don't know what it is that we're trying not to see or do or feel. We're just operating in the world and it seems great. And so when, when Mimoyan asks this question, what kind of demon is chasing you?
there are those who will hear the question and say, oh, I know exactly what it is. I know exactly what kind of demon is chasing me. But he asked the question in such a way that he understands that many people, maybe especially the people he's asking the question to, these people who have dedicated their lives to spiritual practice, that many of them, in particular, will hear the question and say, what? There's no demon chasing me. I came here out of a pure intent. I came here with no baggage, not driven by karma. And before they can even finish that sentence, they're stabbed through with a pitchfork. But we're still left with the basic problem. Because if we know ourselves on that level, we know that the decisions we're making don't happen in a vacuum. We know we know that we're turning right because there's something we don't like that's to the left. We know that not all of our decisions are exactly our own. And Mimoyan is saying, there needs to be more than that. And if we don't know ourselves in that way, if we've chosen not to see ourselves in that way, if we've constructed a narrative that prevents us from seeing ourselves in that way, well, there's not even a beginning to that conversation. And Mimoyan says, you're done. And so there's an invitation here, not just to look at the question, which is a real question. It is a real question, and it's a question that matters. But also to look beyond the question. To see if we can find a part of ourselves, or a version of ourselves, or even a moment, a breath, that stands still in the face of whatever the demon is. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I know the right answer to this koan, because how can you? I feel like Mimoyan is going to stab me no matter what I say. But the more I look at what he's asking, the more I feel like there's a way out. When he says, what kind of demon is driving you? If the answer is, it's this, I'm done. If the answer is, there's no such thing, it's done. But what if the answer is, I know what it is, but it isn't driving me. What if the answer is, I know the demon, I see the demon, and I'm not running away from it. I'm moving in a different way. I don't know for sure, but I like to think that someone at some point said that to Mimoyan, and Mimoyan said, okay, mm -hmm. you can live.
because that's what I want to say. And I want to mean it. And that's where I'll stop. <laughs>